got some awesome singing. Let's give it up for the song leaders one more time. Man. I mean, I bet you didn't know that Jacob knew Swahili. Uh, that's why he has the name White Chocolate, because uh, he is South African. Just joking. But that was an awesome singing over there. What a great service we had thus far. I mean, the welcome was electric, uh, because we know now Paco and Haley are engaged in the Lord. And it was truly a modern day miracle to witness that yesterday. Uh, I mean, it was pretty cranking. Like, Paco went all out. I, they were on a rooftop over there downtown. And then when he got on one knee and he opened up the, the box, it lit up. So I was like, man, this guy is putting us all to shame here with this, <laughs> with this proposal. But it was awesome. But, but every time I go to a proposal or I go to a wedding, it does remind me of when I got engaged and when I got married to the most awesome, spiritual, dynamic, talented, altruistic, and gorgeous woman of God, and that is my wife, Regine, who's serving at Kids Kingdom right now, so. But we dated for a year and six months purely, and we had our first kiss at the altar when we said, I do in the Lord. And that was last year, April 2nd of 2022. And before I got married, I was fired up. Uh, I was so nervous that day, though, when I got on that one knee. I, I remember we had a dinner for the winter workshop. I couldn't even eat. And I think she knew if something was wrong because I always eat. Uh, so the fact that I couldn't eat, she's like, you're probably going to propose over here. But amen. Uh, it, was a, it was a great time in the Lord, and we're super grateful. But I know Paco and Haley are fired up to get married in the Lord as well. And we know a, a big highlight of the kingdom weddings is the reception. And this is, why is this such a special time? Because it's usually by invite only. Not because we don't want everyone to come, because none of us are really rich to, to feed the whole church. So don't be, you know, have, don't, get, don't get mad or so sad that you don't get invited to Paco Hilly's reception. It's just because they're not very rich in the Lord, amen. But you know who, do, you know who does have enough money to feed us? And who is right now is preparing a great banquet for us in heaven? It's God in heaven. And he has enough money and food for all nations all around the world. So I thought today what we can do for our lesson is study out the wedding banquet in Matthew 22. Let's turn there. Matthew chapter 22. Uh, thank you so much, Yelena, for incredible communion. We're going to miss her as she's going to Australia for, she said she's going to be there for three months, but we know the Lord wills. Um, and uh, it was a great contribution by the Fentons. I mean, what an amazing teaching. And I hope we all gave our contribution here this morning. So before we get into this, a bit of a preamble, to understand what we're about to read in the scene of it, just some history be between or about the Jewish society and the first century marriages. So we do know the first century marriages were arranged. So they actually signed a contract at a young age and their parents were arranged in marriage, and that's when they're now officially married. But they will have time to build a friendship, and then they will have an actual wedding. So when that contract is signed, and when they're at an age, the husband will then go and prepare a house for his wife, and then she will go and live with her family. And we don't know how long that will take, and usually it is the father that then tells the, the groom that when the house is ready. This is why Jesus said, only my father knows the hour to come, because they understood that in the Jewish society, that the father only knows when the son's house is prepared for the bride, or for, in our vernacular, the church. Oh, then immediately after, when now the house is ready, he goes without any announcement to the wife's house, and says, now it's time to have the official ceremony and the banquet. And the banquet, you know, we have one day receptions and they're so fun, they're amazing. Back then they had one week receptions. Can you imagine that? A week of partying and food and kebabs and all that great stuff. It was amazing. And then that is the historical context we're about to read. So just keep that in mind as we read this parable. And we understand what a parable is. A, spar a parable is a physical story that has a spiritual meaning behind it. So let's dive into Matthew chapter 22. In verse 1. Give me an amen once you're there. Amen. amen. That's why I gave the preamble so we all could be there. Amen. Verse 1. The Bible says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, 
The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is, is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there, is, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. You know, I believe today, if you are in this room, God is inviting you to his banquet. But it's up to you to make a decision. Will you be the chosen few? And that's the title of my lesson here this morning, The Chosen Few. I got two simple points for us here this morning. The first point is simple. Don't miss your shot. I like to break down this passage into two stories. Break it down from verses 1 to 10 and then verse 11 to 14. Let's first talk about verses 1 to 10. The story that Jesus is telling here is about a great king who took time out of his busy schedule to hand write invitations. I remember just doing this online for our wedding. It took so much time. Could you imagine handwriting invitations and then him himself prepared the food? It was going to be a cranking banquet. Just think about your favorite food. I don't know what your favorite foods are. Maybe it's uh, Chick-fil-A. Like a hundred piece chicken nuggets. I like to believe Chick-fil-A would be in heaven, but anyway, we don't. Maybe it's, I hope it's not McDonald's, but if it's, if that's the case, then amen, think about that. Or maybe it's a nice home cooked meal from your mom or your pops, or maybe even your roommate. Pray for your roommates are cooking for their roommates there. And he has all the, the best food that you could possibly imagine. But then people, one by one, ignore him or simply get hostile. And the Bible here says that God got so enraged. Why did God get so angry? Think about it like this. You know, right now we're in the month of September. We're about to get into some holidays. And one of my personal favorite holidays is Thanksgiving. And for Thanksgiving, we typically don't, because I'm Nigerian, I met some other Nigerians around here. Uh, we don't typically do the turkey and all that. We have some nice Nigerian dishes. And it usually takes days for my mom to then prepare for this. I can't, I would not even fathom or do it, but I can't even imagine. My mom prepares this food. I mean jollof rice, uh, pounded yam, I mean plantain stew, like I'm getting hungry right now just talking about it. And I can't imagine my mom does all this. And then I just say, I work I just ignore that day of the Or even worse, I say, mom, it kind of stinks in here. I don't, I don't want that food. I'm going to go to Wingstop, and then I'm going to go and watch the football game at Wingstop. I, I wouldn't even think of doing that. My mom would get the belt right away, and when we're, even though I'm 28 years old, she will beat me right there, because she prepared this banquet, and she prepared this food to perfection, 
And here I am ignoring her. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says that for he chose us in him before the creation of the, of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. What is this scripture trying to tell us? Before the beginning of time, God was already preparing this banquet and was thinking about you as an individual and he's giving an invitation. And when we ignore him or get hostile towards him, it hurts his heart. And he got enraged because that's what the people did. So just how our moms would be angry if we didn't appreciate a Thanksgiving dinner, God also was enraged. And to go even further, let's talk about who this king is. Obviously, the king is God, and then the son of the king is Jesus. And then it first invites the people who reject him. There's a local meaning and also a general meaning to that. The local meaning is talking about the Jewish people. We understand that the Jewish people are supposed to be God's chosen people, and yet they refuse to listen to the prophets and the servants as God sent many, many to them. And then what happened exactly, the Bible says that then God sends armies to kill them. And they understood this type of discipline from the Old Testament. In 722, the Assyrian Empire came and ransacked the city. In 606 BC, the Babylonian Empire does the same thing as well. But we understand the book of Matthew, although it's the first book in the, in the New Testament, it was written around 80 or 90 AD. And around 70 AD, what happened is there was a general named Titus who came in and destroyed the temple and destroyed Jerusalem, and God then fulfilled this prophecy through that discipline. And then what also kind of represents is those who just refuse to listen and are so distracted by all the things of the world. Isn't it amazing? Every time we go share, we share our faith, we hear all the different excuses. Like, hey, I'm, I'm too busy. Or, hey, I, I, I'm good. Or, hey, I got a lot of work to do. And that's exactly what was happening over here, where people started to be distracted. And it's interesting here, they weren't distracted by necessarily bad things. They didn't say, hey, I want to go and lust. Or, hey, I want to go and party. Hey, I want to go do this. They said one went to his business and the other went to another thing. What does that teach us? Sometimes we could be distracted by good things or things that are not necessarily sinful. But when we put them above God, now they become an idol. And sometimes the world could be so loud, so loud, we're just going through the motions, so loud, we're going to work, so loud, we're going to school, but so loud, we're so distracted that we cannot hear the gentle whisper of God inviting you to his banquet. And we're so distracted, and we think that these things that we're going after is actually going to fulfill us. We're so distracted, we think that school is actually going to fulfill us, a job is going to fulfill us, money is going to fulfill us, or these things are going to fulfill us. not make time for God Almighty. And maybe even here, some, for some of us who are here right now, that you've, you've kind of forced yourself to come to church, and thank God you came. But don't listen to the distractions of the world. Hear the gentle whisper of God, and don't miss your shot. I think another thing as well. The Bible compares the kingdom to a banquet. It's a big party. Yeah. I think sometimes you go, oh, Christian, I got to give up everything. I got to do this. I got to do that. No, you get to give up everything. Come on, bro. You get to be a part of God's incredible, luxurious kingdom. It's an invitation to a reception. It's an invitation to a banquet. It's an invitation. Come on. Wow. And yet, these people refuse to listen to the invitation. You know, 2 Peter 3, verse 8 to 9, the Bible says, But do not forget this one thing. Dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. 
The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Right now, God is patiently waiting that every individual will come to repentance, but many will refuse to walk that narrow road. You know, I remember in 2022 when I did get engaged, uh, it was actually at the Winter Workshop, and it was at San Francisco at Foster City. And we had some issues remembering that. We're talking to Kip and Lane, like, when are we getting engaged again? It was, it was Foster City. It was a great, great time. And I remember that Winter Workshop, I can never forget. I got a call from a brother who was baptized but decided to fall away. And he told me that one of his best friends just passed away. And this was a man that I knew as well, and I'll say that we were pretty close. And the reason why he called me was his family told him to tell me they wanted me to do the eulogy for him. So I can never forget this moment, going to this man's eulogy, being at the pulpit, and they had an open casket. And one by one, his family members said their final goodbyes. I remember standing there and just looking at this man, and I just cried. Because I saw this man who was lifeless, who I invited three times to do a Bible study. Three times to God's banquet. Three times he got an opportunity to get his life right with God. And three times he refused. And I saw him passed away. The Bible does say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that today is the day of salvation. That the, the time is always now. And right now, I believe if you're in this seat, God is asking you to not refuse the invitation. That if you're here today, it's not by chance. Acts 17 says that God sets the times and places for everyone to seek after him and perhaps reach out for him. So if you're here today, God's inviting you. But what are you going to do about that shot? Are you going to make the most of it? Are you going to take it? Because we know we do miss 100% of the shots that we don't take. And we think that we have all this life to live. But you don't know what can happen tomorrow. You don't have it today. Take this shot and do not refuse the invitation of God this morning. You know, it is amazing, though, when people do make a decision to actually take that invitation. And today we have two that come to be baptized into Christ. We have Victoria who's going to be baptized into Christ. And we have Nas who's going to be baptized into Christ. And I just want to share about Nas real quick. It was, it was, Chris Mann's an, he's an incredible man. He just moved from Chicago to pursue his music career. And we actually met at, over there in downtown at Gold's Gym. And I was telling Nas, I have invited so many people at the gym. And so many refuse. But you are the one person to decide to be that chosen few. And today he's going to become our brother in Christ. I want to challenge us. If you are our guest here this morning, follow their footsteps. Make a decision to become a sold-out disciple of Jesus, study the Bible, and get baptized as soon as possible. And for disciples, next week, we have our Bring Your Neighbor Day service. And already surrender to it. We already know what's going to happen. We're going to invite our friends. We're going to invite our family members. We're going to invite all the people in the streets, whatever it may be. And we already know the rejection we're going to get. You already know people say, oh, I'm big, I can't come. But there's going to be at least one person. Yeah. At least one person saying, you know what, I've been looking for this. Mm -hmm. Come on. I've been waiting to get my life right with God. Right. God's not a liar. He chose you. You are the chosen few family. Yeah. He chose you to be in your school. He chose you to be in your workplace. He chose you to be at that gas station at that particular time. Let's not make God a liar. Yeah. That's the truth. That's what the scriptures say. Right. So let's this is the challenge. Let's get every single disciple to get it. Get it out of your name again. Can we do that, man? Yeah. And here's the vision. We want
want to pack out this house. The vision is we want to see just like this vision over here in the, in the parable. There's so many guests, it was filled up. I want to put it before you that we can't even meet in this building by January. And I want to say by this Sunday, let's have a prayer goal to have at least 250 people in attendance right here to hear the word of God preached. And it's going to be a fired up, bring your neighbor day service. Let's get to our second point. I only got two points for you today, so it's a little, a little short of a lesson. Let's go back to Matthew 22. We're going to start in verse 11. We just read it. Now we're going to break down this part. So our first point was, don't miss your shot. Our second point is, make the most of your shot. You only got one shot. So make the most of it. Verse 11. Bob says, when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless, and the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. You know, it's amazing. God says, just bring anyone, bad or good. I don't care. That's the amazing thing about the kingdom. You can come as you are. And just look around. I mean, the kingdom breaks down every barrier. You got Puerto Ricans. You got Africans. You got African Americans. You got whites. You got poor and rich, but maybe a little more poor there. Right? I mean, we have all different types of people. It's amazing. Men and women, look at the book of Acts. It truly was all nations. That's why we're going to have an all-nation service. Yeah. You want people to see that. If you just look around, there's so many different types of people here. So God says, just get anyone. I don't really care who they are. Just get them to come. So why was God so angry then? He said, come as you are. And the guy just came with the clothes he got. And God said, what are you doing here? Take that guy outside. Tie him up. And let him be there with weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's like hard line. It's like, God, come on, man. This guy just came. In. You told him to come. Well, where's the answer lie? Where's a couple passages? Um, and I'm going to read them to you, and you can jot them down. We just sang the song, I hear God singing to me. That comes from Zephaniah. Let me read a passage, Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I'll punish the officials and the king's sons and all those clad in foreign clothes. So in this passage, it says that God was going to punish all those people in foreign clothes. You know, what's amazing about this, like if you think about it, you know, we're in football season. And I know we have some USC students here. Let's do it again. We have the USC students here. <laughs> and then we got the UCLA students here. And could you imagine being on campus at UCLA during a football game? And you see a so-called student in cardinal and gold. Or in, that's the USC colors, red and gold. You're like, dude, what are you doing here? You don't, just, you, you don't belong here. Get him out! He doesn't, he's, he's not gonna belong over here in Bruins territory. And the same way, if you came over there at USC, with UCLA blue and UCLA gold, we're going to say, get out of my house. You don't belong here. Yeah. Now, we understand that's how God feels as well. So there's a couple of traditions they had during that time. Whenever someone will come to a, an event like this, they will give them the wedding clothes. They will give them new clothes. What is that supposed to represent? Drop this down as well. Isaiah 61 verse 10. The Bible says, I delight greatly in the Lord, this is Isaiah 61 verse 10, my soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. So in the parable, it's supposed to represent salvation. And we know that, yes, we respond to God's free gift. So what happened was, this guy probably came to the wedding banquet, someone offered him free, a free set of new clothes, but he said, no, I'm good. And just came in and didn't want to change. 
but still wanted to eat in the kingdom. Still wanted to take what he wanted to feel. See, he wanted to take and not give. Don't ask what your country could do for you. Ask what can you do for your country. This guy did not want to contribute to the kingdom of God. That's why God said, get him out. Because he does not belong here. Now, what does that mean for us? What are these clothes? How do we, I mean, I mean, this sounds pretty awesome. God gives you some new clothes. How do you get those new clothes? Galatians chapter 3. Let's go there. Galatians 3, in verse 26. The Bible says, verse 26, this is, this is pretty awesome. What are these clothes supposed to represent? How do we get these clothes? Verse 26 says, give me an amen once you're there. I'll make sure we don't miss this one. It says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. How do we get the fine linen? It's simple. You must have faith in Jesus. You must repent and become a disciple of Jesus, and then you get water baptized. Yeah. So when these people get baptized here today, Victoria and Nas, they're going to get their sins forgiven. They're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They're going to be added to the book of life, but then God, spiritually speaking, is going to give them new fine linen. And now they're a part of the wedding banquet. And that's the same thing that happened to us as baptized disciples. When we got baptized, God then indeed clothed us with Christ. Are you not fired up in the Lord? Now, that's awesome. That's amazing. But just because you're in the church doesn't mean you kept those clothes on. Let's go to Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, we know this. Well, I hope we know this. This is a part of the second follow-up study we do with this new Christians. Christ is your life. And it talks about setting your mind on Christ. And sometimes I feel like we got to reset our mind on Christ. Where we go through being a disciple for X amount of years, then we start to feel a little bit complacent. And then when that, when that happens, it's time to hit the reset button and reset your mind on Christ. Then what does it say after verse 12? It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, the chosen few, amen, that's you. Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect peace. Drop down to verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So this scripture then talks about, now it's an exhortation to disciples, where it says that we have to consciously make a decision to put on the clothes of these different attributes. Where it says that we got to put on the clothes, clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, and humility. I could probably guarantee that none of us this morning slept in the clothes that we're wearing right now. All of us changed so that we could come to church presentable. Why would the Bible says clothe yourself with these things? It assumes that you don't have them on in the first place. So then now when you get in the kingdom, it's time to become spiritual. And then consistently every day, put on these new clothes and be more and more like Christ. And then it gives an exhortation to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. In verse 23, it says that we should do it, everything with all of our heart. What is the teaching? Is that as disciples, when God gives us the clothes, when God gives us the spirit, when God gives us forgiveness of sins, God gave us this shot. It's now time to make the most of it. It's now time to give God all we got so we can help as many as possible also be clothed with Christ. You see, God calls us to make the most of our shot. Then when we're baptized, is it now time to contribute to the kingdom? 
And it's amazing to see many people now get baptized. And see many people come into the waters of baptism. But the thing is, who's going to take care of all these new Christians? We need more people to step up and say, I want to make the most of it. I don't want to be complacent. I want to be like Paul in Acts 20 verse 24 says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. I just want to finish the task that God has given me. And we know what the task is, is to seek and save the lost, that all men come to know the truth and be saved. And that's what we are here to do as a family. I want to challenge us here this morning. You know if you're giving all of your heart. And I'm afraid that maybe some of us here have decided to get complacent. Maybe some of us here have started to draw back. Because you see all the miracles. And you say, well, I'm in a fired up church. That that must mean I'm fired up. It doesn't work like that. It's time for us, if that is you, You know who you are. It's time to make a decision. Make the most of your shots. The Bible tells us that our days are numbered. And it teaches us to be urgent. How are we going to do it? It's simple. we got to get some dreams for God. That's what Colossians 3 says. Set your mind on things above. Sometimes we get so focused, even as disciples, about our job, about our lives, and all these different things. They're not bad, but... They're distracting you. I want to encourage all of us. God's giving you a shot. God's giving you the Holy Spirit. Make the most of it. Because if you don't, God will take it away. So imagine, to illustrate this, if you had a bank account that deposited $86,400 every single day. That sounds pretty awesome, right? 86,400, you know what I would do with that? I mean, man, that's amazing. But here's the catch. Every day, it gets taken away if you don't use it. If you don't spend it that day, it's gone. You know what's amazing? We do have such a bank. Every day, you get 86,400 seconds. And we know with time, you can't take it back. So the question is, what are you doing with your time now? Are you making the most of it? Because God's giving us time, but now it's time for us to not waste time and make the most of the time that God has given us. I want to challenge us. Let's, Let's get some dreams for God. If you stop dreaming, just repent. We need everyone. It's not just the campus. It's not just this guy. It's not just the interns. It's not just the, we need every single disciple. I want to appeal to you, my brothers and sisters, my family, my moms, my dads, my, my uncles, my aunts. Let's make a decision to make the most of our shot. So that one day, we'll see God in heaven. Let's close out in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, in verse 4. We talked about the wedding banquet today. I hope we're all excited to one day, just imagine this, fellowshipping with Jesus Christ. Chopping it up with Moses. Talking to Isaiah and Jeremiah. Peter, I know Peter must be a talker, so I'd love to talk to Peter and talk about and hear all the stories. And we'll see our brothers and sisters with us. Imagine that day. Revelation 19, verse 4. Let's read verse 5, actually. So then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, all you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of a rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, 
was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. What an amazing scene. Where we know that the bride wasn't mentioned in Matthew 22. Because the bride has not yet come. Because we know that the bride came in Acts 2 when the church started. And then this scripture says that one day those group of people are going to be with God. And God's going to give them clothes that they can wear for eternity. And it says those fine linen stands for righteous acts of God's holy people. I believe now for this week, going into our Bring Your Neighbor Day service, what are the righteous acts that are going to happen in the Metro Coast? What are the righteous acts that are going to happen over there in the West region? What are the righteous acts that are going to happen over there in the Southland region? Because we have a vision that we want to see a thousand for the Lord this month. And I believe God's going to do it because we are those chosen few. And to God be the glory.